Hi, we should be live. Uh, okay, so I have a few minutes to spare and I wanted to just say something about a couple of ebooks that um, I've uploaded recently, uh, which you can download free of charge from my e learning site, which is learn.donaldrobertson.name. And the first one is called The Eulogium on Marcus Aurelius. It's a eulogy about Marcus Aurelius, kind of. And it, it's a piece of 18th century historical fiction. Uh, it's one of my favourite books on Marcus Aurelius. It says some stuff about his life, about his philosophy. It's quite a short book. It's beautifully written. And it portrays Apollonius of Chalcedon, uh, Marcus's main philosophy teacher, um, basically at Rome when uh, Marcus's body is returned after his death and the, the crowds are there to meet it. And this is what Apollonius says. So you can download that book from our website. I'll post the link below. It's called The Eulogium on Marcus Aurelius. It's great. Everyone should read it. It's really easy to read. It's really short. It's a really good introduction, not just to the life of Marcus Aurelius, but also to his uh, use of Stoic philosophy. And we have uploaded another ebook recently. Um, I, I often feel that people aren't very familiar with Marx's life, and really the main sources, I mean, 90%, 95% of what we know about Marx's life is contained in a couple of, a handful of chapters from three main historical sources. There's some other stuff as well, but. Uh, these are the big ones, and so I had them edited, uh, tidied up, we converted them into EPUB, Kindle Mobi, PDF formats. Uh, Rocio de Torres, our graphic designer, did a beautiful cover as well. So you can download uh, that new ebook as well, which is called Marcus Aurelius and the Roman Histories. And the histories in question are Herodian, the Historia Augusta, and Cassius Dio's. Uh, Historia Romana. So I wanted just to uh, give you something from that and read some of my favourite quotations about Marcus Aurelius from those books, just to kind of give you a little taster as it were. So the first one is from Herodian and he says, Marcus Aurelius was concerned with all aspects of excellence and in his love of ancient literature he was second to no man, Roman or Greek. This is evident from all his sayings and writings which have come down to us. To his subjects he revealed himself as a mild and moderate emperor. He gave audience to those who asked for it and forbade his bodyguards to drive off those who happened to meet him. Alone of the emperors he gave proof of his learning, not by mere words or knowledge of philosophical doctrines, but by his blameless character and temperate way of life. His reign thus produced a very large number of intelligent men, for subjects liked to imitate the example set by their ruler. Many capable men have already recorded the courageous and moderate enterprises marked by both political and military excellence which he undertook against the barbarian nations to the north and in the east. But the events which, after the death of Marcus, I saw and heard in my lifetime, things of which I had personal experience in my imperial or civil service, these I have recorded. So we don't know a great deal about Herodian, who he actually was. He seems to have been Syrian by birth. Um, it, he seems to have been some kind of minor civil servant during the reign of Commodus. So he had first-hand experience of the kind of aftermath of Marcus Aurelius's reign, and he clearly, like a, a, a lot of these guys, idolizes Marcus Aurelius as the perfect emperor, and not so much Commodus, uh, whose whose reign he witnessed directly. And there are some interesting things in there. Again, a mention of Marcus Aurelius's writings. I sometimes wondered, you know, if he had other writings. It's not clear what's being referred to there. Um, and to what extent he, the meditations may have been made public uh, in the aftermath of his death. So there's this kind of tantalising hint there that, that Herodian is familiar with some kind of writings. And also this idea that, uh, you know, d what difference does it make that Marcus tried really hard to be a, a wise and virtuous ruler? Um, you know, 
he set an example, Herodian says, and the, the culture of the empire changed because this guy was like a, a beacon. And it's said that many people, uh, it became a fashion to become a philosopher. And it's acknowledged by some of the historians that that attracted kind of uh, fraudsters and like hangers on and, and stuff, but it also inspired many people to become sincere in their pursuit of philosophy, as you might expect. The Historia Augusta, incidentally, that is considered to be a kind of it's a later, it's a slightly flaky source. It's um, probably though derived from other earlier sources. Uh, the chapter, there's a really good book um, analysing the section of the Historia Augusta that's on Marcus Aurelius and it's generally believed that part of the Augustan history is, the, is fairly reliable actually, unlike some of the other bits. Uh, some of the documents, speeches and letters and, and some of these histories are considered, it's considered possibly to be, to be fabricated but many of the details appear uh, consistent with other sources. And the Historia Augusta particularly paints a, a picture of Marcus that's fairly consistent with what we know from the meditations itself. So I'm going to read you an excerpt next from that. And it says, Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, devoted to philosophy as long as he lived and preeminent among emperors in purity of life was the son of Annius Verus, who died while praetor. He studied philosophy with ardour, even as a youth, for when he was 12 years old, he adopted the dress and, a little later, the hardiness of a philosopher, pursuing his studies clad in a rough Greek cloak and sleeping on the ground. At his mother's solicitation, however, he reluctantly consented to sleep in a couch strewn with skins. He received instruction furthermore from the teacher of that Commodus, who was destined later to be a kinsman of his, namely Apollonius of Chalcedon, the Stoic. Incidentally, that's not his son, Commodus. It is probably his adopted brother, who became later known as Lysias Verus. And such was his ardour for this school of philosophy that even after he became a member of the imperial family, he still went to Apollonius's residence for instruction. In addition, he attended the lectures of Sextus of Chironea, the nephew of Plutarch, and of Junius Rusticus, Claudius Maximus, and Cinna Catullus, all Stoics. He also attended the lectures of Claudius Severus, an adherent of the Peripatetic school, but he received most instruction from Junius Rusticus, whom he ever revered and whose disciple he became, a man esteemed in both private and public life and exceedingly well acquainted with the Stoic system with whom Marcus shared all his counsels, both public and private, whom he greeted with a kiss prior to the prefects of the guard, whom he even appointed consul for a second term, and whom, after his death, he asked the Senate to honour with statues. There's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, first of all, it suggests uh, that Marcus embraced the philosophical dress and way of life when he was 12, which is exceptionally young actually. Uh, Romans usually began to study uh, Stoicism much later in their education. And Marcus in the, the Meditations uh, curiously says that it was his painting tutor a guy called Diognetus that introduced him to philosophy. So there's some stuff there. Also it's often been observed that the way in the Meditations he describes his first acquaintance with philosophy, and also in the Historia Augusta there, it kind of sounds a bit more like cynicism. Or certainly it sounds a bit like he's describing the cynic lifestyle, and it's only really later we hear of him attending uh, the lectures of people like Apollonius and Sextus and getting kind of theoretical or um, more scholarly introduction to the, the subject of philosophy. Apollonius was a professional um, philosophy lecturer, and he was probably Marcus's main teacher, although he became a, a follower of, of Sextus probably later. Genius Rusticus was a, more was a Roman statesman, and, and Marcus's right hand man uh, in Rome. He was urban prefect while Marcus was uh, engaging in the Marcomannic War at the beginning, anyway. And 
he, Junius Rusticus was, seems to have been Marcus's most beloved tutor, but he would have been, I think, more like a personal mentor um, rather than a sort of prof- professional philosophy lecturer. And he, it's interesting also that he studied Aristotelianism, as mentioned here, under Claudius Severus, although in the meditations there's some indication that, that, that Severus was an Aristotelian who was kind of influenced by Stoicism. So there's a lot of cool stuff there. Uh, finally, Cassius Dio, who was a senator uh, during the reign of Commodus, so again has real kind of like first-hand experience of the, the Senate and of Commodus and, and of the aftermath of Marcus's reign, also loves Marcus, like not so keen on Commodus, uh, very similar to Herodian in that respect. So this is what Cassius Dio says. In addition to possessing all the other virtues, Marcus Aurelius ruled better than any of us who had ever been in any position of power. <laughs> he loves Marcus. To be sure, he could not display many feats of physical prowess, yet he had developed his body from a very weak one to one capable of the greatest endurance. Most of his life he devoted to beneficence, and that was the reason, perhaps, for his erecting a temple to beneficence on the capital, though he called her by a most peculiar name that had never been heard before. He himself then refrained from all offences and did nothing amiss, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, but the offences of the others, particularly those of his wife, he tolerated, and neither inquired into them nor punished them, So long as a person did anything good, he would praise him and use him for the service in which he excelled. But to his other conduct, he he paid no attention, for he declared that it is impossible for one to create such men as one desires to have, and so it is fitting to employ those who are already in existence for whatever service each of them may be able to render to the state. And that his whole conduct was due to no pretense, but to real excellence is clear. For although he lived 58 years, 10 months and 22 days, of which time he had spent a considerable part as assistant to the first Antoninus, the Emperor Antoninus Pius, and had been Emperor himself 19 years and 11 days, yet from first to last he remained the same and did not change in the least. So truly was he a good man and devoid of all pretense. As a result of his close application and study, he was extremely frail in body, though in the beginning he had been so vigorous that he used to fight in armour and in the chase would strike down wild boars while on horseback. And not only in his early youth, but even later he wrote most of his letters to his intimate friends with his own hand. However, he did not meet with the good fortune that he deserved, for he was not strong in body and was involved in a multitude of troubles throughout practically his entire reign. But for my part, I admire him all the more for this very reason, that amid unusual and extraordinary difficulties, he both survived himself and preserved the empire. Just one thing prevented him from being completely happy. Namely, that after rearing and educating his son in the best possible way, he was vastly disappointed in him. This matter must be our next topic, for our history now descends from a kingdom of gold to one of iron and rust, as affairs did for the Romans of that day. So, wow, that's a pretty dramatic ending to that particular section on Marcus Aurelius from Cassius Dio. And again, this kind of paradox that he notices that Marcus was famously very sickly and very frail. Um, He had problems sleeping, he had very poor appetite, he had chest and stomach pains. Um, But Cassius Dio says that in a kind of paradoxical way, he was also very resilient. Well, you know, what does he mean by that? Marcus lived to be nearly 60. He outlived many of his contemporaries. Um, I think Commodus died in his 30s, like early 30s perhaps. 
And Marcus's co-emperor, Lucius Verus, also died in his 30s, if I remember rightly. So these guys seemed much hardier than Marcus. Like, they were sporting types, uh, and that's often commented on. Um, and Marcus was the kind of fair, frail, sick, sickly, studious one. But he lived to a reasonably old age for a Roman, particularly someone living through the plague and campaigning on the northern frontier where life was pretty tough. Uh, so... I, Cassius Dio is right to observe that, in a sense, he was quite resilient. And also probably having in mind his stoicism and a kind of, you know, his emotional, psychological resilience as emperor. He did deal with uh, a lot of problems. It's almost as if the universe was testing Marcus Aurelius. There were two major earthquakes during his reign. There was a famine. The River Tiber flooded. Um, there were several uprisings, there was the Parthian War, uh, there was the, the, the Marcomannic War, like those two wars basically took, uh, took up most of his reign. And there was a civil war against him as well. So he was pretty busy. Uh, the preceding reign of his adoptive father, Antoninus Pius, was, was famously peaceful by comparison, kind of uneventful. As soon as Marcus took to the throne, why well, it's like the universe decided to throw all of these natural disasters and conspiracies and military incursions against him that he had to deal with, um, and and he endured it all, why like, and rose to the challenge. So that's what the histories say. Uh, as many people note, the histories contain bits that look fabricated embellishments. There's gossip thrown in there, uh, stuff that looks like propaganda. Um, so we have to, we can't uh, take them entirely at face value. We've got to take them with a pinch of salt. But nevertheless, they're definitely worth reading. And as long as we kind of compare them to each other, look at other sources, you know, we can uh, get a more rounded picture of Marcus's reign. He, I also wrote an article just picking out the main criticisms of Marcus that we can detect in in the histories because there are a few, uh, and that's kind of interesting as well. Uh, and you know, looking to to what extent was propaganda? Are they justified? And there were certainly people that opposed Marcus. There appears to have been a faction on the Senate that was against him. And there, as I mentioned, there were several major uprisings, in, including a full-blown civil war, although very short-lived. So, a little bit about Marcus Aurelius. I hope you found that useful. I those are some of my favourite quotes. They're kind of teasers in a way for the whole book, which is free. I just want people to have it and be able to read it. So you can download Marcus Aurelius in the Roman Histories and read Herodian, the Historia Augusta, Cassius Dio in that. We've just taken the excerpts that are relevant to his reign and download that free of charge on any ebook reader. It's also in PDF format. And there's also, as I mentioned earlier, another book called The Eulogium on Marcus Aurelius, which you may enjoy. So I shall post the links in this thread, and you're welcome to let me know what you think of those ebooks. Thank you very much for listening, and goodbye once again.